covenant have faithful promises and time and time again you have proven that you do just what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow i'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come have you here today. And for those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel, welcome to you. Thanks for tuning in and watching our service. My name is Steve Dautrick. I'm the associate pastor here at Waterway. And we're just delighted to have you here this morning. If you are visiting, a special welcome. Thanks for coming and exploring your faith here with us. If I could ask a favor of those who are visiting, we have a connection card attached to our bulletin. If you would take a moment to fill that out. And then in the back, in the lobby, there is a box that you could put it in right outside the doors to the right. And we'd appreciate that so we can connect with you as a visitor to our church. Waterway Church is an evangelical Mennonite congregation. And our desire is that everyone comes to be more like Jesus. And that's our goal. And we hope that today's worship service will do just that. It would encourage you in your faith so that you could become more like Jesus. 
and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We want to give a special shout out to all the moms, and we certainly hope that you moms feel loved and appreciated. I know it's one day out of the year we're supposed to do that, but we hope that you all feel loved and appreciated the whole year through. So happy Mother's Day to all you moms. Well, let's continue our worship. I invite you to stand, and we're going to continue singing. This next song, Simply to God Be the Glory. If you'd like to turn in your hymnal, this is hymn 298. again. My name is Ross Johnson. I am one of the elders here at Waterway. Thank you for joining us today. So we just heard a, we just heard the gospel message. If you're watching online later uh, or if you're here today, you just heard the gospel message. So you now have no excuse for not knowing what it takes to be a believer. So the first verse tells us what God has done, and it mirrors John 3.16 very closely. The second verse told us what we must do, and if you're trying to remember that, I'm not going to ask him to put it up. It is in your hymnal or Google it later, um, to God be the glory. And then the third verse finishes and tells us what we can expect, what we will expect in the future. So it's moving from the great, which is the, what God has done to, for us, and it finishes with the greater when we see Jesus face to face. So amen. Thank you, team, for picking that song. Um, that's a good one. Moving right into the devotions, uh, which today is coming from Proverbs 23, 22 to 25. It'll be on the screen behind me. Join along with me in your Bible or electronic device, however you choose. Again, Proverbs 23, 22 to 25. Listen to your father who gave you life, 
and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it, wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. May your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth be joyful. So uh, Steve said earlier, happy Mother's Day. I think all of us are aware that today is Mother's Day. Many of us today have plans to honor our mothers. And some of us may suddenly be panicking and trying to think of how we can honor our mothers. A few of us know the pain of missing our mothers. And a few of us know the tragedy of not having the kind of a relationship with our mothers that we would like to have. But if we look at the wisdom found in Proverbs, we can see that the best way to honor our parents is not with flowers or gestures on a holiday, but by living lives marked by wisdom and righteousness. So if you're feeling short on wisdom or righteousness, now is a good time to pray to God and ask for those gifts to be given in your life. Moving on to announcements and prayer requests. Uh, so note that the numbers, Steve mentioned the bulletin and the connection card, but in that bulletin, I think you're going to see a numbers section, and it includes the current amount in our building fund, uh, just over 112000 Excuse me. We have been financially blessed as a church lately, and we've been able to pay down a lot of the principal on our mortgage. So for the time being, our building fund is dedicated to our upstairs classroom project rather than the debt reduction. So we need to have $150,000 in that building fund by midsummer to be able to complete our upstairs construction project. And that project will be starting when we're done with VBS. We had a business meeting in March where we discussed and decided this together. So this is a reminder that our building fund is 100% dedicated to this upstairs project at this time until that goal is reached of 150,000. But you can see we're at 112 already, so praise be to God, uh, we're getting there quickly. We will have baptisms at Waterway on May 22nd and June 5th during our Sunday morning worship services. So we're going to be doing that here in years past. If you've seen baptisms, we have generally done them off site but now I start to say, now we're on campus. Is this a campus now? Can we call this a campus now that we have a pond? And, but we're not going to do it in the pond, so don't, I don't want to get ahead. Get ahead. That's, that's, that's a future project. So as of now, there are 13 people planning to be baptized. So that's another praise the Lord for that. And another four who will be transferring their membership to Waterway. So today is the last day to talk to Jesse if you would like to be baptized. And Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, if you feel led to be baptized, I'm sure Jesse will talk to you about that and go through what that requires. I don't think we tie membership to the request to be baptized, although we do, if you want to be a member, you do need to be baptized. Is that correct, Jesse, if I'm saying that right? You could be baptized and not necessarily become a member. Not typically. Not typically. So strike what I just said. Talk to Jesse. He's the wise one. Yes. I should never add things to what he gives me, right? Um, I do have a couple of messages here quickly. So Global Disciples is who we're working with uh, this month, the month of May. Uh, so let me read this. Uh, let me tell you first a little bit. They work to plant churches around the world, and we're going to have a representative from Global Disciples sharing with us next Sunday. But this is from the mission uh, team chair, Jess Engel, mission and outreach team. So this month, Global Disciples will be receiving our mission gift. Global Disciples is based in Lancaster and works to equip people to reach their nations by training leaders living near the least reached communities to multiply disciples. Global Disciples currently partners with 1,600 groups of churches in 62 nations. If you would like to give more personally, above and beyond what we're giving as a church, you can donate directly on the Global Disciples website, globaldisciples.org. Another note from the missions and outreach is that 
Um, they will be doing, we will be doing a spring food drive again this year for the Lighthouse Youth Center and Neighborhood Service Center. A list of requested food items are in your mailboxes. And uh, another note, we do have physical mailboxes. If you'd like one, we'll try and uh, find room to get you added. But please have all donated food items to the church by May 29th. If you have any questions, talk to Jess Engel. Hello, Jess, over there to my, to my left. Another, uh, you've seen the table in the, in the lobby for Bible school. So here's a note regarding Bible school. In our goal to be more mission-minded at VBS, this year the elementary kids will be making tie blankets to be donated locally. I'm not sure I know what a tie blanket is, but anyway. We are looking for donations of fleece fabric, and each blanket needs two pieces that coordinate. One and a half yards square. If you have any questions, please see Carrie Johnson or Maria King. I'll read the whole note. Pointing to Carrie, it says, not the strangest or the tallest, but still pretty weird. And Carrie wrote that note, so thank you, Carrie, for that. Yes. If you put it up here, I'm going to read it. Oh, my. I think that is all the announcements. Uh, just a reminder, there is an offering box in the back uh, if you feel so led to uh, put an offering in that box. A lot to be thankful here this morning. Um, would you join me in prayer now? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you first and foremost for the gift of life. Each one of us here has been blessed with that. Bodies that function, minds that think, the means to gather here, the freedom to gather here. We're thankful for those most basic things that we far too often take for granted. Father, forgive us for that. Let us continually remind ourselves of the blessings you give us each and every day. Father, we thank you for this physical building. We thank you for this property. We thank you for the foresight and wisdom that people before us had to plan this. Father, we now ask your blessing on these projects that are coming up. We ask that you would uh, keep us focused on the mission of seeing people come to know your son, Jesus Christ, to know his saving grace, his love, his mercy, his kindness, his forgiveness of sins. Keep us focused on that, Father. Keep us focused on helping us become better disciples of Christ, to become more like Christ. Guard us and protect us from the evil one, we ask, Father. Let us recognize his, his plans, his schemes, his deceptions. Make those clear to us, we ask. Father, we pray for global disciples and the work that they're doing around the world. We pray for our missionaries that are scattered around the world, that are preaching your word, living faithfully for you, and doing it in spite of some fear and danger. Um, give them strength. Let them feel the comfort of your Holy Spirit's presence, we ask. And Father, we ask a blessing on the rest of our time here this morning. We echo to God be the glory. Let that be our call here this morning. Let that be our focus. Let everything that we say and do be pleasing to you and glorifying of you. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, we invite you guys to stand again with us as we continue to worship through song. This next one talking about God's faithfulness again. He's always been faithful. Morning by morning, I wake up. Watch him amazed in all of the 
thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your song this morning simply the traditional hymn great is thy faithfulness isn't our god faithful he's a good god isn't he amen turn in hymn 196 if you'd like to turn there
sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. This is the time in the service where we invite kids to come forward for Children's Church. So today we have Children's Church. That means that kids between the ages of four years old and first grade are invited to uh, come down and talk with me for a minute and then go out and have a class of their own during the sermon time. Hey, guys. How are you guys today? Doing Doing good? All right. All right. How are you guys today? All right, all right. I see we have the Cochranville contingent has arrived. Well, I'm glad you guys are here today. Now, do you know what you know what special day it is today, right? Mother's no, no, it's Sunday. It's the day we we get to come together. Mother's Day? Yes. Oh, okay. How many of you already today did something special for your moms? Did did you? How many of you forgot this morning and you're going to have to do something later? <laughs> Yeah, well, there's some big people in the room that are the same way, the same way. And so listen, here's what I want to remind you about today. I want all of you, I want all of you to be super thankful to your moms for all that they do for you, but not just to your moms. Here's something I'm going to challenge you on. On Mother's Day, I want you to be thankful for all the things that your moms are doing for you, all the things that your dads are doing for you, all the things that your grandparents do for you, and all the things that God does for you. Does that sound good? Yeah. Because our moms are really special, but they're not the only ones who bless us, right? So we will be thankful to moms, dads, grandparents, and the Lord, and anybody else who helps you. So, I can sense that it's time for children's church. So can we pray? Drew, you got it exactly right. Let's pray together. You remember how we pray? I like to put my hands together, and I usually bow my head and close my eyes. God, I thank you that so many of us can celebrate having wonderful mothers. And if they weren't wonderful, they tried. Lord, I thank you. And Lord, I thank you for the healing that you give us no matter what our past has been like. And Lord, I thank you for all of these boys and girls who are here. And I pray that you'll help them to be thankful for all the good gifts that you put in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming down, guys. Now, this is the. <laughs> Sometimes I wish you guys could all see what I get to see. It's just, it's just really fun. This is, the, uh, this is the time of the service lately where we've had, uh, where we've had different folks come and share and, and talk about 
um, testimonies and things that are happening in their lives. We're going to continue to do that next week. Global Disciples, uh, a few of their representatives are going to be here to tell us about the mission of Global Disciples, what they're doing, what kind of mission work they're involved in today. Um, but today, here in the room, uh, Justin Hollinger is with us. And Justin Hollinger, uh, many of you know Justin spent a lot of his growing up years here at, uh, at Media Mennonite Church. And then uh, when he moved to Quarryville, got involved there. And now he's all over the world. And so, Justin, since you're here, um, I'm just going to invite you to come forward with me. Um, so far, nobody has said no. Uh, Justin didn't say no either. He has nothing prepared because I just told him half an hour ago, I said, be on your toes. And that's, that's it. I had a professor in seminary tell me that if you are going to be working for the Lord, you need to be ready to pray, preach, or die at a moment's notice. I got the third one down. You got the third one down? <laughs> Justin, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions because um, we know about Why Not You Ministries. We've been supporting Why Not You Ministries in Honduras for a number of years here. Some of you have been there on campus. Some of you uh, have been praying or sending money. And there's been some transitioning that's happening organizationally with all that. And you're a big part of that transition. And so now it's not just called Why Not You. The group is called? Uh, Puerto K. No Two. Oh, you even got the little R roll. You're learning it's your coming. Spanish. It's coming. Por qué no tú? It, it's in the Spanish translation of why not you. And so um, if you don't mind, just, just give us like half a minute. What are you doing down there? What's it been like in Honduras? You've been there for a couple months. Now you're back. What's happening on the ground down there? Um, so this year is a transitional year, and my main goals this year was um, are learning the language and building relationships. And then when I get frustrated with the language, I go out and take machete to the land and start clearing it and, and working on the farm. <laughs> That's pretty good. And, and so you didn't know any Spanish before you kind of started to get immersed down there, right? Very little. Solamente yeah. un poco. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Less than that. And, and how old are you today? Uh, 41. You're 41 years old today. So, Justin, why does a 41-year-old man who doesn't know Spanish move to Honduras to do mission work? How, how did, I mean, how did this happen? Seriously, like, how did you know that that's a pretty big change? That's a pretty big, I mean, some people might say an upheaval, right? How did you know that why not you? How did you know that it was you? How did you know you're supposed to do this? Um, it was probably two years ago. There is, I don't know, a certain point in my life where it was like something big was going to happen. And I had no idea. Right around the age of 40? Yeah, probably. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so that spring then, my pastor asked me, he said, would you want to be in charge of the youth group? I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. But he's like, pray about it. And during that time of prayer, I felt like I was supposed to call, um, email Bob Martin and ask him, I was like, hey, is there any like way He's I the can director of Why Not You yes. Ministries. Yeah, right. is there any way I can help you? And through the whole time, he was like, uh, yeah, we've been praying for someone to take over our mission. <laughs> Why not you? <laughs> Why not me? <laughs> and so I, I just kind of put everything together, went down there for two months, and it just felt like home the first time mm -hmm. I kind of walked onto the property and, and got really excited, and I'm still excited. Good. Well, thank you. Is there, while you're here, is there anything else you need to tell us before you sit back down? Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, thank you for your support um, with Jess and Kim being on the board and the financial support that you'll be giving me and your prayers. I'm very coveted. So thank you so much for all the support. I do feel blessed um, in having a good support team. Let us pray for you. Can we do that? Yes. Lord, I thank you for uh, Bob and Sandy Martin and for the work that they've done over the years and for all the folks who have partnered along with them uh, to help Why Not You Ministries be a success and bring the gospel and, and the love of Christ to Honduras. And Lord, I pray for Justin now as he is um, in, the, in the early steps of this new transition and, and organizational changes and learning the language. I pray that you'll bless his mind that he can, that he can learn to communicate in Spanish in a way that would just defy expectation. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless his work so that whether he sees it or not, that the impact of your spirit would radiate out from around him. And Lord, I pray that you will uh, bless his hands and his body as he goes to do work, as he machetes, <laughs> as he machetes the spaces that need clearing, as they work on um, clearing out for buildings and soccer fields, and, and as he works with, uh, with new friends there. Lord, I pray that you'll give his body strength that he would be able to keep working and stay healthy and just be able to keep his hand to the plow 
And so, Lord, I thank you for Justin. I thank you for all those who get to support him like we do. And I pray for, uh, I pray for a multiplication in this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. One of the questions I'm going to be asking you today, church, is what you're called to. What are you called to? There are things that happen in our lives that we just do. We, we might say that we, we just fell into it. Or, or things that, you know, momentum or, or, or inertia just kind of takes hold of us and we end up doing a job or living in a place or, or being with a group of people that we didn't plan it, we didn't look for it, and we didn't, frankly, even think about it, but here we are. I'm going to be asking you today, I'm going to be asking you today to think about what are you really called to? Is God calling you to be where you are? If so, do it with all your heart. But I suspect that in a room this large, that there are some people who have either been rejecting God's call or not listening for God's call or who were not aware that sometimes God calls. And so that is the question today. That is the endeavor. How do we discern the things God is calling us to. And today, our text comes from Mark chapter 6. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles, follow along on the screen, or, um, or open up your Bible app to Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13. Okay? Mark 6, 1 through 13, as we continue this study in the Gospel of Mark that we began back in January. So in the first five chapters of Mark, we've seen the establishment of Jesus' ministry. We see how um, Jesus has been kind of moving around in, in the area close to his home, and we see how God has put tremendous power upon him, and so Jesus, being the Son of God, has been putting this power to use, and especially uh, we, we see how he's been teaching and performing miracles, and it's getting people's attention. And so here's what it says now in Mark chapter 6 as the story continues. Jesus left there, that is the place here he had been, and, and, and I'll give you the context in just a moment. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Remember that word, amazed, okay? Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? And so here in these first two verses of Mark chapter 6, there's kind of a continuation of the story. We've seen people, at least here recorded in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen people be amazed before. In Mark chapter 1, it talked about how Jesus went into a synagogue in Capernaum and he began to teach. And the people there were amazed. And while he was teaching, it says that a man was possessed by an evil spirit and that man came and confronted him and Jesus cast out that evil spirit while he was teaching in the synagogue. Jesus then went on and healed Simon's mother-in-law, and people flocked around him then. People began to look for Jesus and follow Jesus. That was Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 2, there's a story about so many people gathering around Jesus to hear him teach and to hear him preach. When Jesus was preaching in a house, there were a couple of guys who had a, a man who was paralyzed, and they were carrying him on, on kind of a sheet, kind of a blanket, a tarp kind of thing, and they couldn't get close enough to Jesus for, for them to ask Jesus to heal their friend, and so they cut a hole in the roof, lowered their friend down. This is the kind of crowd that is being established around Jesus. That was Mark chapter 2, and these people responded in amazement. But we've also seen people in the Gospel of Mark respond with hatred rather than amazement. In Mark chapter 3, this is after these healings and after a lot of amazing things have happened. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus went into another synagogue. He healed a man with a shriveled hand. And people who saw it were so offended by the things that he said and the way that he did this and the timing of it that people actually plotted how to kill him. Some people are amazed. Some people are offended. And then we see Jesus traveled to a place called Tyre and Sidon. The people there crowded around him so much that he had to get into a boat so that he had space to be able to teach them. And then in Mark chapter 5, the last two weeks, we read about Jesus' miracles, how he cast a legion of demons out of a man who was living wild in the land of the Gerasenes. We read how Jesus healed a woman who just touched his cloak. He didn't even <clears throat> try it. He wasn't even 
doing big, amazing things. He simply was there. She touched his cloak and she was healed. Jesus brought Jairus' daughter back to life. These are the stories that we've been reading about. These are the stories that people would have been familiar with at this time here when Jesus is coming back to his hometown. And so these people, verses 1 and 2 of Mark chapter 6, they, they see what he's doing and, and they hear his teaching and they're amazed. Where does this man get these things? What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are the remarkable miracles he is performing? And it almost sounds like it's just one more story. But then in verse 3, we see that there's a different thing happening here. Their amazement turns into some deeper questions. Isn't this a carpenter? And the answer is yes. Jesus would have been a carpenter. He, that was his father's profession. Jesus, the oldest son, would have grown up learning that profession. Remember, Jesus didn't start being a full-time out there minister guy until he was about 30 years old. So those first years of his life, he was working at something. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. A couple fun things to note there, just that really helps your Bible trivia performance. Uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters, yes. Now, now these were, you might say these were only half brothers and sisters because we know that, um, you know, Mary bore Jesus. Joseph was pledged to marry Mary, but Joseph was not genetically Jesus father. Now, James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and these sisters would have, been, would have been sons and daughters of Mary and Joseph. Nonetheless, these are Jesus' brothers and sisters. We know that he had at least four brothers. We don't know much about the sisters yet. But this is something that we learn, right? Jesus had a family. Sometimes we forget that. We see Jesus as this son of God, this preacher, this teacher who's out doing Jesus kind of things, and we forget that, no, he had he had an upbringing that would have been, you know, typical according to what the people around him saw. That's why they're asking this question. The people in his hometown, well, wait, isn't this the carpenter? We know that guy. He's the guy that built the door frame around my house, right? Isn't this Mary's son? No, they don't say, isn't this Joseph's son, which would have been more expected in that day. I mean, we don't even get the names of Jesus' sisters. It was a patriarchal culture, but yet this is Mary's son, Probably by this time, Joseph is dead. Joseph would have been alive at least until Jesus was 12, because we're told in Luke chapter 2 that Jesus, when he was 12 years old, went to the synagogue, and basically his mom and dad lost him, right? Like they went home, and Jesus was still back in the synagogue teaching. And so Mary and Joseph were still together. Joseph was still alive when Jesus was 12. It seems that by this time in Jesus' early 30s that Joseph has passed away. But we don't know for sure. What we do know is that people were looking at him and saying, this guy? Isn't this Mary's son? The brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? We know this guy is what they're saying. This guy, they, they don't quite say, but he, he's kind of like us. He's just a normal, normal dude. It is, is part of what they might be thinking. And what happened? When they asked those questions, they didn't cheer and say, yeah, this is one of us. Do any of you know anybody famous? Like, like really famous? I don't think I do. Do you know anybody from your high school that went into professional athletics? Maybe somebody that was drafted by a baseball team. So, you know, that's the closest some of us get. You know, when I was in ninth grade, we had a 12th grader at our school, and he was drafted in the 17th round by the Minnesota Twins, you know. It's funny how we rally around those people. Some of those people get trophies in the cases of our high school lobbies. It, it's amazing how when, when one of our own does well, oftentimes, especially if it's something that we value, well, that, that's our boy. You know, we invite him back to talk to the high school kids. Or, or we invite her to come back and, and, and tell us, how did she do it? These folks, they are amazed by Jesus' teaching. They are amazed by the people following him around. They are amazed and astonished by what he has been able to do, the people he's been able to heal. But they were not proud of him. That's our boy, Jesus. They were offended by him. Which, by the way, is not so different than the responses of the people 
sitting in this room right now. And the people living in our world right now. There are some people who observe the power of Jesus Christ. They've seen it in your life. They hear you testifying. They're aware that Jesus is important to you, the church is important to you, the faith is important to you, and there are some people in your life that they look at that and say, way to go, Chad. I I mean, good for you. Tell me more about it. There are people who respond that way. But what do you also see? And some of you see this with your families, right? Some of you have had people people you love very much, people you think understand you, people who ought to understand you, and they looked at you and said, I can see your faith. I can see your priorities. I can see that you're trying to live for Jesus. I hear you talking about church, and yet they say, David, why do you waste your time with that? Right? Some people respond to a legitimate expression of Jesus Christ with great offense. Why? Because some people just, well, there's all kinds of theological reasons that we could get into for why, but, but Jesus is offensive to some because he forces people to make a decision. These people made a decision. They said, this is just, this is the carpenter. This is Mary's son, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon's brothers. He's got all these sisters around here. But there's another little layer here that might have affected the way that they were thinking. Think about this for a moment. It seems that Jesus' father is dead. Okay? seems that Jesus' father is dead. Who is Jesus among James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and the sisters? Who is Jesus? He's the oldest son, right? Number one son, big brother. And what's he doing? Did he step into the family business and say, guys, I've got this. Mom doesn't have to worry anymore. That would have been expected in that culture and, and dare I say, in some of our culture here. That would have been expected Here's a guy, he's able, he's fit, he's strong, he's been trained, he knows how to be a carpenter, he's done that by trade. He's not an old man by our standards, but 30 then was a bit older than 30 is now. Nonetheless, he was still at the prime of his life, able to work, and what did he do? Well, he ran off and he's out in the boat talking to this guy who everybody knows is crazy. I mean, you can imagine some of the things that some folks might have said. Jesus, his culture would have told him, frankly, to stay home and take care of the family. His culture would have said, Jesus, I don't care much about your passion. Your responsibility is to your home, to your family, and to your mother. See, one of the things that we often forget, the people in Jesus' day did this, we do this too. We forget that culture exists to serve God. God doesn't exist to serve culture. Society exists to serve God. Government exists to serve God. Christ came to serve, and humanity exists to worship God, but God is not our butler. Just saying, what can I do for you folks today? No, God is the creator, and he's created these systems, and he's created our relationships, and he's put us in this place so that we will serve him. And yet there were people in Jesus' day that were saying, no, 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 Jesus You had better serve the tradition. You'd better serve your mother, better serve your family. Jesus Jesus offended them because what did he do instead? He was baptized in the Jordan River. And then he went out preaching and teaching. And as it seems by what we read in the Gospels, left a lot of his carpenter work behind. Do you remember, those of you who have been following along, in Mark chapter 3, talked about how Jesus was teaching in a house and a crowd gathered. Do you remember in in Mark 3, verse 20, it says this. I I remind us all. It says that Jesus entered a house, Mark 3, 20, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. So crowded, can't can't even eat. It says in Mark 3, 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. He had four brothers, a couple of sisters, and a mom. And, and they see Jesus teaching, preaching, doing what it is that he's been doing, and they go get him. He's out of his mind. Big brother has lost it. Why? He should be home. He should be taking over dad's shop. He should be taking care of mom. But look what he's doing now. Sometimes people get offended by Jesus Christ because they, they start to think that he's here to work according to our perspective. 
But that's a problem, and Jesus addressed it. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 4, as we continue on. They're offended. They, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the guy that we know? Some of them may have been saying, isn't this our brother? But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. And then look at verse 5. Interesting. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. That, that was all. That was all he could do. Lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. I mean, we would do backflips if that happened in our midst right at this moment. It says in verse 6 that he was amazed. Oh, there's that word again. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Verse 1 said they were amazed at him, and now he is amazed at them. And these couple of verses bring up a really interesting question. It says that he couldn't do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few. Why? Did you ever think about that? A lot of you may remember that. A lot of you may have, if, if you grew up in church, grew up in Sunday school, you may, oh, prophets with honor in his own hometown. You, you may have had that thing roll off your lips, but do you know why? Have you ever thought about that very deeply? There's a couple of possibilities. Why, why couldn't Jesus do any miracles there? Well, perhaps, perhaps people doubted his ability to heal them, so they didn't come to him. I mean, you remember the lady we talked about a couple weeks ago? She had been subject to bleeding for years, and she came to Jesus in a crowd. She, she was so determined to get there, she said, if I could just touch him, and she touched the edge of his cloak, and, and she was healed. That takes a lot of faith. That takes a lot of energy. That takes a lot of, a lot of get there to get there. And she was healed. You know, if people don't come to Jesus looking for healing, they don't very often get healing, do they? I wonder if the reason why he couldn't heal them is because they didn't come to him. That's just a carpenter. That's just that Jesus guy. That's, that's, isn't that their brother? Why would I go to him? I never thought about that before. That was an interesting idea to me. Some have said that the reason why Jesus couldn't do any miracles there, it's not that he wasn't able to, but the people didn't have faith and Jesus didn't think it was appropriate to heal them. Those of you who are Bible scholars, those of you who are really curious, let me give you an assignment. This week, this week, go through your New Testament. Go through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see if you can find an instance of Jesus healing someone who stated that they had no faith in him. Just see if you can find that. If you find a verse like that or an instance of that, please let me know. I'm not going to, I, I, I'm racking my brains I didn't have time to really research it the last couple of days, but I'm curious, is there ever a time that Jesus heals someone against their will? Is there ever a time where Jesus says, well, you don't want me to heal you, but I'm going to? Is there ever a time where Jesus says, you don't believe in me, but I'm going to work my healing power in your body anyway? Look that up. Look that up, church. Maybe that's why he couldn't heal very many. Maybe it was because they didn't come to him because they just didn't believe. Maybe it's because Jesus said, okay, you don't believe? You're not getting healing. That, it's interesting. Some people have suggested that maybe Jesus' family and hometown is basically just kind of his kryptonite. Now, this doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I mean, in Mark 5, we read about Jesus getting out of a boat in a land of little faith, yet he kicked out 2,000 demons from one guy with a word because the guy said, help me. I don't think there's a lack of power here. I don't think Jesus suddenly showed up and, oh, mom's here. Oh, my brothers are here. My little brothers, this makes me really nervous. I find that when my little brother's around, I want to make a bigger show. <laughs> right? Are any of you the oldest in your family? How many of you who are the oldest have said, well, I guess I better tone it down. The young ones don't like it. Oh, not me. That's when I say, you bet I'm the oldest. I'm going to do what I want to do today and tomorrow and next year because I'll still be the oldest. Not always a good attitude. Probably not the attitude that Jesus had. But I think for us to suggest that Jesus was not able to do miracles because, well, his family was there and these were, these were the people in his high school class. That doesn't hold a lot of water to me. Interesting stuff to think about, though. It seems to me that this lack of faith, there were a couple people. I mean, Jesus healed the, the few sick people. He told us that in verse 5. I, see, I assume and I suggest that Jesus didn't heal many people because not many people came to him. Why? Because they were offended. You're not going to go to 
get healing by someone who offended you? How many of you have left a doctor because that doctor offended you? Even if they might have the answer, they said something, they had an attitude, they treated you in such a way, you said, I'll find somebody else. It's fun to think about this stuff, isn't it? We may not know exactly what was going on. We can ask Jesus about that someday in heaven. But he was amazed at their faith. And then the story goes on in Mark 6, 6, the second part of it. It says, after that, Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. These are his 12 disciples whom he's called out from the area in the last couple of weeks, couple of months. Calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Jesus didn't just stay home sitting around moping, oh, the people here don't have any faith. No, he knew who he was. He knew what he had to offer. He wasn't going to let a faithless few get in the way of his mission, so he moved on. It says in verse 8 that these were the instructions he gave to his disciples. Interesting stuff here. Pay attention. These were his instructions. Verse 8, take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. It's not a camping trip. You don't need to load up the car. Just go. Okay. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. In other words, you don't have to have sore feet. Wear your sandals, but you don't have to take an extra shirt around. Why? Look at verse 10. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. In other words, rely on the hospitality of the people there. And now think about verse 11. Think about this. Mark is writing this down. And just a couple of verses before, we see what Jesus said about his own hometown, right? We see what he, these, he was astonished. He was amazed at them because they didn't have much faith. Look at what Jesus says to his disciples when he is sending them out, when he's giving them authority to do what he's been doing. What does he say? Verse 11, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Now, Mark does not say that Jesus walked out of his hometown, walked away from his brothers and sisters and shook the dust off his feet. doesn't say that. It says that he healed, he healed a few. People came to him. It just simply says that then he went on. And the instructions that he gave to his disciples were, as long as the place welcomes you, keep telling them about me. As long as the place welcomes you, you're not using your food, your shelter, your extra shirt. They're going to take care of you. They're going to welcome you in. As long, disciples, as long as you're there, enjoy that hospitality. And as long as you're there, stay in the same home. After you're there a couple days and you start to get a reputation and the rich people start inviting you, no, you stay at the people that invited you. But if they will not receive you, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. To us, that might just sound like a shaming. But there was more to it than that. This shaking the dust off your feet. This is what Pharisees did. Pharisees were the very, very proper religious Jewish men. The Pharisees, if they were leaving an unclean place, place that by their religion was called not fully holy. They were told, their, their custom was to shake the dust off their feet, right? What does mom tell you if you're outside? Don't wear those muddy shoes in the house. Same kind of thing. Pharisees are like, we're done with this. We're out of here. Shake, shake the dust off the feet. What does Jesus say to his disciples? He says, if a place doesn't welcome you, he doesn't say, double down and really dig in. And I, I want you to make sure that you just put it right in their face. You show them the power that you have. No, what's Jesus say? This is fascinating, isn't it? If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. It's almost, you know, I'm walking out of town and, hey, you guys. We have different symbols that people in our society might give if they're leaving town and not so excited about us. Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet. What happened? Verse 12. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. That's pretty cool. That's the disciples going out. That's not Jesus going out with them. He sent them out two by two. They went with the power of God on their own. They preached that people should repent. They drove out demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now, the, the Bible never talks about Jesus anointing people with oil. But it does say that one of the first messages that he gave when he began to preach was that people should repent. And it does say that Jesus drove out many demons and healed sick people. These people are going out doing what Jesus told them to do. And what does Jesus say? Right after his hometown got offended at him and rejected him and, and not many people were saved, what does Jesus say? Somebody doesn't want you, 
Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Jesus says there is plenty of people that are ready to hear. Don't waste your time with those who say no. That is interesting to me. Some of us, maybe you, maybe me, have been called to stay in the same place for a long time. And some of us, some of us have a, a missionary style that, that you might call the marathon. We say, we're in this for the long haul. That's, that's what I've been called to so far. I've been here for a long time, 20 years this summer. 19, oh, I'm, I'm, so, Melanie reminded me it's 19. We'll be married 20 years. <laughs> I'm in that for the longer haul. Thank you, Melanie. Some of us are called, and, and, and some like Justin Hollinger are called, you know, in the middle of life, just go do something different, learn a whole new language, and do a whole different thing. It's interesting how God works, but what does Jesus say? Jesus says, well, go, and as long as people accept you, keep preaching, keep working. And if people reject you, shake the dust off your feet. You may ask and say, well, there are people in my life who are difficult. There are people in my life who have rejected me, but I still love them. There are people, okay, Jesus is not saying here, all people everywhere, if somebody says no to you, shake the dust off your feet right in their face. This is not instructive for everybody everywhere. He told these disciples, as they were going out in those pairs of two, he said, shake the dust off your feet. Remember, there were not, there were not 15 churches in every community at this point. This message about the gospel is brand new to the people that are hearing it. Jesus is getting these disciples out in the world. Now, we are in a world that is saturated with outposts. Some of us are called to live for a long time, but this is why I ask you, this is why I ask you, what are you called to? Because these are the things we have to think about when we consider a scripture passage like this. But these disciples went out, preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil, and they healed them. We need to take a quick break. You need to stand up. Stand up. Take a breath, and take another breath. <sighs> Say hello to your neighbor. And as you look at their faith, consider whether, as you look at their face, consider whether you are still called to be near them. <laughs> and as you think about it, sit back down. I'm going to shift gears for a minute. We're going to come back to this Jesus and shaking the dust off your feet thing. But I just want to tell you that next week, Melanie and Bree and I will be at West Union Mennonite Church, which is up in Rexville, New York. Okay? Um, Rexville, New York, uh, actually the church, West Union, is about a mile north of the Pennsylvania-New York state line. Okay? It's north of Potter County, Tioga County. Like If you know Germania or Ulysses and keep going up, it's, that's where West Union Mennonite Church is. Uh, next Saturday, Kenny Watterson. Some of you remember Kenny. Kenny grew up here for a long time until he moved with his family a couple years ago. Uh, Kenny Watterson is marrying a young lady named Amber Lewis on Saturday. And so I am privileged to be able to be part of that wedding. And on Sunday morning, I'll be preaching at West Union Mennonite Church. West Union is one of our AMEC churches. AMEC, A-M-E-C, stands for the Alliance of Mennonite Evangelical Congregations. This Alliance of Mennonite Evangelical Congregations is 27th in Pennsylvania, but we have some others in New York, Delaware, and Oklahoma, believe it or not. Uh, locally, Mount Vernon and Andrews Bridge and Sandy Hill and Rockville are all churches that are part of AMEC with us. Um, but I'll be up there next week, and, and so Pastor Steve will be bringing the message. Something that strikes me, West Union currently is looking for a pastor. And West Union is at a lovely spot. A few of you have been there. It's at a beautiful spot out on, on top of a I would call it a mountain because I'm from Oxford. The people up there don't tell people from Rexville that they live in the mountains. That's, that's offensive for a flatlander to say that kind of thing. But West Union is, is looking for a pastor. And, uh, and, and I'm on the board with AMEC, and so I am helpful, trying to be helpful, in just spreading the word and trying to find someone who will go and, and serve there as a pastor. They have an interim um, a fellow named Bob Waters who's doing a great job, uh, but he's just there for a short time to kind of help things stick together. And it's interesting, uh, their pastoral search committee right now is chaired by Buford Waterson. 
His real name's Kurt. Everybody up there knows him as Kurt. We all know him as Buford. Buford is Kenny's father. It's a long story, but we are Mennonites. This is how it goes sometimes. <laughs> but Buford is chairing that search committee like he did here twice in the past. And here's what I wonder. There is no one yet in that, in that area, in that church, who has kind of risen up to say, you know, I feel called to be the pastor here. That may happen, but it hasn't happened yet. There is no one locally there yet, and it's just been a couple months, right? This hasn't been dragging on and on. But there is no one there locally yet who has said, you know, I feel called to this job, or, or whom the church has identified and said, this person should come and serve. That hasn't been worked out yet. Still a lot of question marks. And, you know, I've talked to a couple people who would be qualified, but they're from around here, and they say, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to go there. The winters are cold. They are. They're, it's not that far away, 180 miles, 200 miles, but it's a little different than here. Who's going to go? Perhaps God will raise someone up from there. That'd be fantastic. That may still happen. Again, it hasn't been a long process yet. Not all avenues have been explored. But in the past, there have been so many folks and so many families who have, who have relocated from this general area where there's lots of Christians and lots of churches and gone north or west where there's not as many just to go help. And so I'm wondering, who will go? Who will go? I've run into a lot of people who are a little bit fascinated, but they're also fearing, feeling very obligated to the things that are here. I talked two weeks ago at our anniversary service about, about folks who started Media Mennonite Church because they came down from At Glen to work at a different mission field. We talked about people who, from Media Mennonite Church, planted churches those were in the South, and there were a number of them. We didn't even get to talk about all of them. There were so many people going and doing things in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Who will go and leave their family, their home, their connections, maybe their business, maybe their farm? Who's going to go? and help at the places where Christians need help, and in the places where the gospel needs to continue to be proclaimed. Again, it's, it's not as if we have all the answers and resources here. You understand what I'm saying. It's not like we have to help those poor folks in Potter, Tioga County, and in New York. No, no, no. No, these are good folks, and there's a long history of the gospel there. It's a strong church, and there are good things happening. But they need a pastor. Who's going to go? I have three questions to ask you today. And I'm going to end with, well, <laughs> I'm going to end with these questions and a couple of answers. Question number one. This is probably really appropriate for us to ask on Mother's Day. But question number one, what do you expect from your family? And those of you who are parents, what do you expect from your children? I want you to think about this. I want you to go home today and this week, whether your kids are little or whether they're big or whether they don't even exist yet. What do you expect if you're a parent or if you're thinking about being a parent, what do you expect from your kids? What do you expect as far as how they will treat you, how they will visit you, how they will, how they will take care of you? Do you expect that? How and why? Do you have a right to expect that? All right, that's, that's one question. What do you expect from your kids? Question number two. Now, for you personally, what do you feel obligated to in your family? To whom are you obligated? Now, if you are a parent and you've got young children, you are obligated to those children. Husbands, you are obligated to your wives. Wives, you are obligated to your husbands. Obligation is, is kind of a legal term. Obligation means that you're fulfilling a pledge or a promise or a contract. But how many obligations do you have in your family? You adult children out there, 
with parents who are still living? What are your obligations to your parents, to your brothers, your sisters, your aunts and uncles? What do you owe them, really? See, we have a lot of assumptions in this room, and that's not a bad thing. Some of the assumptions are legitimate, true, godly assumptions. But I want you to think really carefully. What do you owe your family? Give them what you owe them, but make sure you consider carefully what you owe them. Do you owe your parents money? Do you owe your parents honor? Well, we know you owe them that because the Scripture says that, right? Do you owe your parents staying in the area so that they have stability when they're older? Do you owe that to them? Think about it. What do you owe them? What do you feel obligated to do? For you? So question number one, what do you expect from your family? Question number two, kind of what is expected of you? What do you feel obligated to do for your family? And then here's question number three. Different than obligation. Second one was, what do you feel obligated to do for your family? Here's question number three. What are you called to do for God and for your family? There's, there's a whole category of things we feel obligated about, which we are not called to. But because of some sacrifice that was made on our behalf, or because of some guilt trip that was drilled into us when we were young, or because we have siblings who are deadbeats and won't help out. If we don't, who will? Or because of financial situations? Or because of business realities? Or because they still hold the deed on the house and I don't really have anything yet? There's a whole lot of reasons that this stuff can happen. But there is a difference between the things that you feel obligated to and the things to which you are really legitimately called by God. What is a call? It is a command from God. And so here are these questions one more time. Number one, what do you expect from your family? And do you have a right to that? Number two, what do you feel obligated to do for your family? And is that feeling of obligation legitimate? Or is it just something that's been placed on you or that you've taken up that's not yours to carry? Number three, what are you called to do for your family, really? And because we need to be thinking biblically and not just based on what the people around us are doing, because they might be out of their minds... Here are a couple of Bible verses. I like the Proverbs. Proverbs 19.26 says that whoever robs their father and drives out their mother, that's a child who brings shame and disgrace. So don't ever rob your dad or drive out your mom. Clear enough. Proverbs 20.20 says that if someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. That doesn't sound good. And Scripture is clear that we ought to honor our parents. So don't curse them. That's pretty easy for us to wrap our minds around. Proverbs 23, 22, Ross read it this morning. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Be careful about that when she is old part. Maybe think that, but don't say it. Proverbs 30, 17 says that the eye that mocks a father or that scorns an aged mother will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley and will be eaten by the vultures. That's just a little bit of scriptural color for those of you who need a picture. So there are these teachings in scripture that say, look, we cannot, we cannot just cast our families aside as if they don't matter. We cannot curse them. We cannot mock them. And Jesus gave a great example in John 19. I'm wrapping up here in a minute, band. Why don't you come forward and start getting ready? Jesus, Jesus gave an example in John 19 of caring for his mother. It says in John 19, 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. This is while he's hanging there dying. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, four ladies there. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, Standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to John, he said, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. In other words, Jesus looked down and said, Mom, you know my friend John. John, you know my mom. Look after her. And she lived with John from then on. Jesus didn't leave his mother in the lurch, so to speak. Big brother came through. However, Jesus did not make his family or his mother the most important thing in his life. In Matthew 19, 29, Jesus says that everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother for, or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Do you know anybody who left fields for Jesus? Do you know anybody who left their dad or their mom for Jesus and they were blessed? 
And Jesus said in Luke 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. That does not mean that you scorn and mock. Hating is a matter of degree here. Jesus says you'd better love me more. And your love for me better make it look like you hate your family. That's what Jesus is saying there. He's saying this is your call to love me this much. Jesus did not say your family is just as important as me. He didn't say that. Jesus was very clear to say that he is primary. What about you? How are you thinking about this? What is your obligation? Church, what is your calling? Would you stand and sing with us as we sing a closing song today? I think the, uh, the title is quite appropriate. Enough? <laughs> Enough? Enough? Let's sing together. the expectations you have upon your children and the people around you and make sure they're legitimate. Don't put anything on them that God has not called you to put upon them, okay? Think about this and pray about it and talk about it together. And if you are feeling obligated to your family and if God has called you to that, don't you dare run away from your obligations. If you are really called to care for someone, look after someone, and to be God's answer in their life, you do that. With all your heart, whether that's mom or dad or or anybody who needs you, I'm not telling you to run away from responsibility. But what I'm saying, and what I think Jesus would instruct us to do, is in all of the ways that we feel responsible, we need to think about whether that responsibility is a legitimate call from God, or just someone else's selfish, or irrational, 
or sentimental hopes that they've placed on our lives, but they have no right to do so. You know what I'm talking about? And moms and dads, that's where it gets especially complicated because with all the things they did for me and all the ways that they sacrificed for me and how could I not, but, but that can become a trap and they can fall into a trap of their, just out of their own weakness. I'm not indicating an evil heart here, but sometimes moms and dads just expect things from us that we are not called to do. And sometimes Jesus even calls us to leave our moms and dads to go do stuff for him. So think about this, church, and pray about this. Because I'm just standing here wondering, who's going to go? if we all stay. God, give us wisdom. Holy Spirit, please fill our hearts so that we can, we can live out our real obligations and, and we, can, we can correct our lives in the ways that we need to correct. Lord, we want to be oriented all the way around you because we know that you are enough and we know that you are enough for all the people who think they need us. God, help us. And Lord, thank you Thank you for reminding us today that indeed you are enough no matter what our calling might be. In Jesus' powerful and precious name we pray, amen. All right, church, go be the church. Blessings to you.